What's up, guys? Um, I was messing with my skateboard backstage, and she was like, they're calling you out there, so. Uh, you ever, um, you ever have those, like, kind of fucked up existential moments when you're like, how did I get here? Because five minutes ago when I was in the bathroom backstage trying to figure out what to talk about up here, um, I was having one of those moments, and it kind of, it, it landed me at a place where um, it, it really brought to light one of these ideas that I love talking about so much. And that's, that's this idea of navigating your way through life or your career or your personal life or whatever it is using something that I call the Tarzan method. I've talked about this in my videos before. And just parenthetically, I was like Googling Tarzan method to figure out who actually coined the phrase and came up with this. And I think I've talked about it in so many videos that it, when you search it now, it's just my name. So my apologies to whatever genius came up with it. It's mine now. <laughs> um, so the, the Tarzan method sort of, I was here three years ago, four years ago at South by Southwest, and I was speaking at the um, film festival part of the, of the event. And when I was there, I was just coming off of the heels of my HBO show, and during that presentation, I talked about how I had made feature films, and I, and I had a TV series on HBO, but I was entering into a new phase of my career, which is I wanted to embrace sort of new media and online and, and YouTube and spaces that are not traditionally celebrated um, and certainly three, four years ago, were, weren't regarded with the same respect that traditional media has. And it was entirely theory when I was talking about it to that audience then. Um, but had you asked me then, or had you told me then that I might be doing what I'm doing in my career now, there's no way I would have ever understood how I could ever get from sort of A to B, which brings me back to this idea of the Tarzan method. So in its simplest terms, what that means is you're Tarzan on one side of the jungle, and you want to get to like Jane or whatever on the other side of the jungle, and there's like a, you think there's this clear trajectory to get from A to B. The trouble is there's no way to really get you there. There's no means of transporting you to where you want to be. So instead, you reach out for whatever vines in front of you, and you just grab onto that fucker. And it, it kind of swings you in like the wrong direction, but it gets you a little bit closer. But it takes you to a place that you didn't anticipate being. And then you're there, and you still see where you want to be, but the next vine takes you all the way over here. And you're somewhere you didn't imagine yourself being but it also gets you just a little bit closer. And this idea has been something I've clung on to and, and it has had this like profundity in every aspect of my life because I think the only time in my life and certainly in my career when I thought I had a really vivid idea of exactly what I wanted to do was when I first started making videos, when I first aspired to be a filmmaker. And this was like 2000, that, that 2000, 2001, when you could first make videos on your computer. And this is when, I'm going way back here, guys. This is when they put out these DVDs, and it was Chris Cunningham, Spike Jones, Michelle Gondry. Anybody remember these DVDs? And they were like, right? They were like, what is now a YouTube channel of like these weirdo highlights and excerpts and like short films and clips that never made it anywhere because they have no they no, like, they, there was no place to put this kind of content then. So they released these DVDs, and I watched those like you would study the Torah. Like the Spike Jones, I just over and over till the DVD melted. I studied that. And I watched that, and I was like, well, I want to be that. I want to do that. I'm going to make music videos, and then someday I'm going to make a feature film, and that is my trajectory. So I, like, I moved to New York City, which was a step directly towards the other side of the jungle. And then I got there, and I was like, okay. I'm here where my feature at. And like there was nothing. So I like grabbed onto the, a vine that was being a bicycle messenger, which is the worst job on planet Earth. Don't let any of those like tattooed, dreaded out dudes romanticize it. Bullshit. <laughs> that is a horrible job. Um, 
I remember like my first week on that job. This is like 2001 when you paid for minutes on your cell phone. Remember, like I'm low on minutes. Call me at 801. <laughs> and my cell phone bill at the end of the week was $100 more than my paycheck because they'd have to call you for your dispatch. I digress. But that, it was that gig that introduced me to an artist that I ended up working for. And when I worked for him, I was making short videos in my free time. And he saw me, he said, I like those. He showed them to someone else. And that guy liked those. And then all of a sudden, I had an opportunity to make a video. It was like a birthday video, but it was still a paid video gig. And all of a sudden, I became a professional filmmaker. It was literally like a happy birthday, Fred. Like it was one of those, like a bar mitzvah kind of video. But it was still like I, I got paid to make it. That's what makes you professionals when you get paid to do something. And that was when I became like a professional filmmaker. But the idea of like, going from even just, that was just a little step. That got me like 2% across the jungle, but that was an indirect path. Um, and that kind of thing continued, it continued through. My HBO show was like an absolute, like the definition of that grabbing onto a vine, having no idea where it might swing you and having it land you much closer to where you ever imagined yourself being. You know, the, the, the HBO series, it said in front of it, HBO, an HBO original series. If there's somebody here from HBO, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not shitting on you guys. It's just like, it said HBO original series. Like, this is bullshit. Like, we made that and then sold it to them. And they bought it outright. Like, and how we made that is my brother and I made all these videos for some interesting people. And this guy saw it and he had sort of a public access network. And he was like, let's do something cool together. And we're like, OK, just fund us. And, and we'll make all these videos. And we'll do something rad with them. And he was like, oh, OK. And we made all these videos. And, and we kind of formed and padded them together into like eight chunks of video. And then we just put like a title at the beginning and credits at the end. And we're like, it's a TV show, obviously. <laughs> and, and HBO, HBO bought that. But even when we made this deal with, Tom Scott was his name, the guy who, who really got behind Van and I to, to make what ended up being the HBO show. Even when we first sat down with him, the idea was never a TV show. It was, let's just do something together. And that gentleman, Tom Scott, who, who's a huge entrepreneur and one of the few people in my life that I would, I would call a, a mentor, somebody I truly look up to and admire, he embodies this idea of, of grabbing onto whatever's in front of you. He, he started a juice company called Nantucket Nectars. How good is Nantucket Nectars? Half and half. You got the half the iced tea and half the, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but in any event, he was like, let's do this. And, and together we made this thing. We had no idea what it was. And it ended up being this HBO series that had this formality to it. It was this big deal. And then all of a sudden I was there and I was like, I was, I was a, I was a big deal. I was a guy who had his own show on HBO. Um, and then it aired and like nothing really happened with it because like who the fuck watches TV at midnight on Fridays? Fuck HBO. <laughs> um, like imagine if you could only see my YouTube videos in real time at midnight on Fridays. <laughs> TV. But that happened, and around the same time was when I was making, I, I started flirting with this idea of producing feature films, and the, the weight that having a, TV, a successful TV series gave me enabled me to produce films, so I made a couple of feature films with my friends, and you know, like we premiered at the Cannes Film Festival. We premiered the first feature film that I ever produced right here at South by Southwest. Um, yeah. And, and even then, I remember kind of sitting around and I was like, okay, this is, this is interesting. This is like my version of that Spike Jones thing. I was like, but it still doesn't kind of feel right. And then when I had this, this moment after the HBO show and the feature films where I was like, no, I need something more. I'm going to pivot to new media and I'm going to figure that out. I had no idea what that meant. But I had such confidence then to really grab whatever was in front of me and hang on to it and see where it might take me. Um, because it had, the idea of embracing uncertainty and embracing risk had yielded so much success for me in the past that I now began to count on it. Like the only safe thing I knew to do was to take the biggest chance possible. Playing it safe was a surefire way to fail and taking chances was the best way I knew to, to, to find success. And, and that's what brought me here to South by Southwest, whatever it was, several years ago, embarking on this new mission to embrace the world of, of new media. 
um, which now I can say, and it's sort of, uh, I feel like I'm an authority on something like that, but then I really had no idea what it meant. Um, so I, I want to show you a video now um, that I can totally tell you guys are getting sort of bored of my <laughs> Tarzan. Um, this, this video, I think, embodies the idea of the Tarzan method in a way that's kind of silly and ridiculous. This is a video that, um, that is really, really stupid. Uh, I'm not kidding. This is a really stupid video. Um, but what, what this video did for me is, is where it gets really interesting. And I think I have to play it so you can really have fresh in your minds just how stupid this movie is. And then I can explain the context around it because, um, all right, I'm just going to play it now. Okay. I'm getting a ticket for riding my bike not in the bike lane. Felony, guilty, not guilty. Everything you need What's to the fine? See, you're a bicyclist, so it's, it's anywhere um, from $10 uh, up to $130, depending on your record. But it's a bicycle sum, it's a bicycle sum just for not riding in a bicycle lane. You know. Lower. that keep you from probably riding in the bike lane. show and elsewhere, the police continue to crack down on biking infractions. As the number of bikers explodes throughout the city, ticketing is on the rise. Casey in Manhattan, you got a ticket this month? Uh, yeah, I got a, a ticket about three weeks ago for riding my bike not in the bike lane. Not in the bike lane. Alex is holding up a sign that says, <laughs> you could have just said it, oh, okay. his sign says, not illegal. Yeah. I wish I had known that before I paid the $50 ticket. Well, so... Th So, uh, any filmmakers out there, anybody who's ever opened iMovie before, the reason why those titles were all like off-centered is because I edited that in like iMovie 6, and that was the best I could do with titles. Um, that movie represents such an inflection point in my career, and I think the ridiculousness of that video really, for me, validated and, and came to really illustrate this idea of, of running with things that on the surface don't seem to make a whole lot of sense. So that video, for example, um, you know, when I made this decision to embrace this world of new media, which I didn't know what I meant, and I, I, my brother and I stopped working together, and I knew that after, after 
my HBO show, which considered like the culmination of everything I'd worked so hard for. It aired and it was a wonderful creative experience, but it didn't have the reception that I wanted. I wanted to embark on this new thing and I started making YouTube videos and nobody watched them. And then I made that and it just exploded. And, and Mike Bloomberg, the mayor of New York City at the time, like had to answer to that video at a press conference the next day, which is just absurd. Um, but what came of that, that, that to me was the most interesting thing is, I got a phone call about a week after I released that video on YouTube from a guy named Jason Spingarnkoff. And he was like, hey, I'm from the New York Times. We love that video. And we'd love for you to do videos like that for us. And I was like, I think you have the wrong number. And he was like, no. We liked your video and we liked that it communicated an issue that was hard to talk about and nobody really gave a shit about, which is this idea of how police in New York City are enforcing uh, laws against cyclists. And I was like, okay, well, that's, that sort of makes sense. And, and thus began a really fruitful relationship that I had with, with Jason and his team at the OpDocs department of the New York Times for several years. And it was because of that, that that my work was shown in an entirely new light and in a new context. And people took it seriously in places where maybe they shouldn't have or the otherwise wouldn't have because YouTube four years ago, five years ago, was not the YouTube that we understand today. And it brought an entirely new audience to my work. Um, Keep in mind the video we're talking about now, that one where I crashed my bike into a cop car. That video accomplished that. So again, this came, this came back to really validate this idea of, of grabbing onto whatever was in front of me, running with it, um, without having much idea, much understanding as to where it might lead you. So one thing that started to happen uh, after that video and the success of a, a handful of other videos especially after the success of the videos that I was doing with the New York Times, which um, they don't pay very well. New York Times. But it did put my work into a context that enabled people to take it seriously. And because of that, I, I started to have opportunities to work with brands, real opportunities to work with brands. Now, prior to this, prior to this I did make a living um, in advertising. Uh, an okay living for a number of years where like, I don't know if anybody here has had much experience in advertising. The whole thing's like a fucking pyramid scheme. Like it's total nonsense. Um, uh, and basically it's like, is that guy walking out? I'm sorry if you work at, at an advertiser. <laughs> just, just, um, but you know, I, I would get hired as a TV commercial director and I'd come in and there'd be storyboards and scripts and Basically, you point the camera the way that it looks like on the paper, and you do that, and then you get paid at the end of the thing. And it was like, okay, that's fine. I was a terrible TV commercial director. Terrible. Um, but I kept doing it. It's like that Beastie Boys song, it's a nice place to visit, but a better place to rob. That's how I felt about working in traditional advertising. But as my YouTube videos got more and more successful, brands and advertisers alike started to see them, and they're like, can you do something like that for us? Um, and this is a really foreign idea, a really foreign idea, 2010, 2012-ish. Um, stuff like this didn't take place then. That awful, awful word called influencer, which is like, yeah, don't call me, don't call me influencer. Is the word. That didn't exist yet. And this idea of like branded content, like that wasn't a thing yet. But because I kept making these videos, brands were curious and they wanted to work together. Opportunities kept presenting themselves. Um, and th thus came what, for me, was one of the, the biggest opportunities in what was then like my professional career. And I use that word professional very lightly because my YouTube channel, the short movies I was making, the feature films I was making, all of this didn't pay the bills. It was a way of sort of sharing with the world in the industry what I did, what I cared about, where my passions were, and, and me flexing my like, creative muscles. Like this is a, a silly video like that. It's something I love making. But it didn't really pay the bills. Instead, it was more a way to, to just exemplify what I could do. So when I say professional, I mean like a way I could actually make a living. And these opportunities came to me in a, a number of different uh, manifestations, but Nike in particular was a brand that contacted me and they were doing a small activation in, in the Lower East Side in New York City and they're like, it's for cyclists, will you make us something? And I was like, yep. And they gave me a budget, I think it was like 2,500 bucks and we made this super cool little bicycle video and they loved it. They thought it was great. Um, then they flew me out to uh, 
Oregon a few, a few weeks later to like talk to some of the, the big wigs there at Nike. Um, they flew me business class, by the way. It's awesome. So awesome. Uh, <laughs> and I met with them there, and I, you know, I, I met with like one executive in particular named Alex Lopez, awesome guy. I call him ALO for short. Um, super cool, dude. And he was like, you know, we're launching this new product and we want to do some video content behind it. We're talking to our agency, we're talking to this, we're talking to that. But we'd love for you just to, to take a stab at it. What would you do? So I was like, oh, yeah, no, of course. I'll, let me get right back to you with a proposal. And then like Googled, how do you write an advertising proposal? <laughs> um, and like I sent him a pitch for like three videos. Um, and they were like, great, let's do it. Uh, just get us a budget. And this is a fun little asterisk to this story that I've only recently started to tell, but they were like, send us a budget. And I was like, mm-hmm. And like two weeks later, they're like, yeah, we just need the budget. And like, what do you, I, I, like, what does it cost? Like, it's like five videotapes, is it like eight bucks each? That's 40 bucks. <laughs> You're like, I don't know. Um, so I literally like finally just sent him a number that was just an email that was like budget and then it was just one number. <laughs> and there was no itemization, there was nothing. And I just like clicked send and I was like, oh. <laughs> and like, I didn't hear from him. And then the next email, just like a week later, it was like moving forward with the creative and all this other stuff. And then I like, we're on the phone and I was like, oh, and by the way, about the budget, um, is that cool or? And he was like, yeah, if that's, if that's what you need, that's fine. And I was like, oh, great, cool. Means you didn't ask for enough money. If they say yes, you didn't ask for enough money. Like that really, that story has no, what'd that guy say? That, I'm not telling you the number. That's, that, that's like, when I talk at South by Southwest 2021, then I'll be able to share the number. I gotta, like, I gotta get there. I, was, I still have a great relationship with them. <laughs> oh. So we went out and we made the first couple of videos. And they're fantastic, like really great videos that I'm super, super proud of. And you know, one of the videos, we got to work with their big athletes, um, which was amazing. I had to have like a babysitter with me because I don't really know how to act around big, expensive, fancy athletes, but it worked out really well. Um, we were working with a footballer, which was really rad, like a professional NFL player, and we went and did some stuff at a high school, and that made its way into the video, and Nike called, and they're like, hey, you didn't have permits or anything to shoot at that high school, which is not cool. Turns out Nike bought them a, I'm 95% sure this is a true story. <laughs> Nike had to buy them a new scoreboard for their football field, so they would let us use that scene in the video. Just put it in the budget. Um, but then it came time to make the, th the third video. Um, now, this is like my second, newly was my favorite video that I've ever made, but now it's my second favorite video that I've ever made. But this video represents so much risk, slash, you know, like risk goes to here, and then like the very next step is just like stupidity or recklessness. This probably crossed that line. If not, it was very close. But the, the nut of this story is just that like, the first two videos really adhered to the script. They're a big success, everybody's happy with them. The third video, I was just like sick of it. I was exhausted and like it was, it was we're months into this and I, I had this like crazy idea and I, I called my buddy Max and I was like, Maxie, here's an idea. I was like, first of all, Nike sent us the whole budget ahead of time. <laughs> like don't, don't do that. And, and I was like, and I have this idea I've always wanted to do, which is let's just show up at an airport and we'll get on the next flight out, like wherever it's going. And then we'll go to some other crazy place, country, city, and we'll explore there and we'll go back to the airport and then we'll just keep doing that. And we'll bounce from airport to airport, city to city, country to country, until we run out of money or whatever, get locked up or murdered or whatever. We'll just keep doing that. And he was like, yeah, that's, I guess my wife will probably let me do that. That sounds funny. He's like, what about the video? And I was like, I don't know. But I do know that like, if we do this, which is this wild idea that I've ever wanted, that I've always wanted to do, and I think anyone who's ever experienced any wonderlust in any capacity has wanted to explore some version of this idea of just, just running around the world with total freedom. 
And I was like, there's some beauty in that. And if we can capture that, that would make a great video. And he was like, great, I have no fucking idea what you're talking about. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so that's what we did. And, and I remember being on the phone with Alo. And I was like, Alo, I'm not shooting the script we talked about. I came up with this other idea. And we're going to do it. It's going to be great. You're going to love it. And he was just like, don't, don't burn me, Casey. And I was like, bro. <laughs> I was like, brah. And so we did it. We did just that. And like, it, was, it was just as much of an adventure as you could ever imagine. Like, you know, like being trapped on a bus traveling through some weird sub-Saharan African town where there are literally like six people sitting across the back of the bus like this from midnight till 5 a.m. when you get to the next city. And they just had like uh, Christian evangelists on the TV with like full volume through the entire night. Um, that kind of experience was amazing. And we came back and we had this just trove of footage, 40, 45 hours of footage, I think. And we're like, okay, let's turn this into a Nike commercial. Um, and we've failed miserably just over and over and over and over. And there was this event in New York City where we were supposed to show it. We missed that. Um, we were actually supposed to premiere it here at South by Southwest. South by Southwest is a much bigger part of my biography than I give it credit for. We were supposed to premiere it here at South by, and like, we just didn't make it. We didn't even come. The video wasn't done. Eventually, Alo showed up at my office, and he was like, just show me where you're at with this thing. And I remember him standing over our shoulder as we're like scrubbing through the edit bay, like showing him some of the clips and stuff. And I looked up at him and it was like that thing your dad does when he's like not mad, he's just really disappointed. <laughs> and I was like, fuck. And eventually we finished the video. And this is like, this video represents this idea, which like anybody out there has ever made anything, whether it's a painting, a video, a drawing, you've written a script, you've written anything. When you start video, you've got a pile of footage. If you're a writer, you have a stack of paper and a pencil. When you start, you have this gross, rusty lump of steel and you just start hammering on it until it starts to take shape and it gets a little shiny. You just keep, you just don't stop until that big gross lump of steel turns into like this magnificent Excalibur-like sword that you can conquer an empire with. And that's what happened with this. Like we, we knew there was something amazing in there, but we had no idea how to get there. And it was nothing but just hammering away that got us to that point. Um, and we made this video, I'll show it to you now, but we made this video and this video was like, I think up until World Cup, um, where they had that like really handsome footballer with like the shaved body. Um, you know what I'm talking about? It's like super handsome. Cristiano, Cristiano. Such a hunk, that guy. Okay, but up until that video came out, this was the like the most watched Nike video that they had that they had ever made. Um, let's watch it, shall we? Shall we? Definitely make this flight, but we're cutting it close. So far, the trip is off to a fairly irresponsible start. And so it begins. We got to Paris, 17 degrees outside. The airport, it's okay. Welcome to Cairo. All in all, very successful. We visited Tahir Square. <laughs> we rode horses. But Max almost fell off of his. <laughs> Now
stuck in Nairobi. We're at the Vatican right now. We're leaving Rome and renting a car. The trouble is all of the street signs are written in squiggly lines. Back in Doha. Our flight for two minutes ago. We're in Bangkok. We have a terrible taxi driver. It's drinking. Hey, Swanee. What's up? We forgot to eat today, and I've got the shakes real bad. This is the gnarliest airplane food I've ever seen. Look at this wiener. One, one like, one funny, just that like sinkhole jump, which don't ever do. Um, I, like, I was like Batman three for like the next six weeks after doing that. But like when I climbed up to the edge, that's called the, I think it's called the Bachmini sinkhole and it's in Oman in like the middle of fucking nowhere. And I like get up there and if you look at that shot, you see that the sunlight, the shadow cuts right across frame. And I remember we like set the cameras up. We get up there. It took us forever to get there. We're in the middle of like the, the Middle East. We have no idea what we're doing. We get there. Max at the bottom of the, the sinkhole. I climb all the way up to the top. I got nothing on but my short shorts and my, and my tan. And I go up to the edge and I'm like this. And I'm looking at Max. And he's like, it's not safe. Don't jump. And I was like, we came all the way to the Middle East. Like, you got to get this shot. And I'm standing there like this. And I'm like, one. Two, and they're like, ah. and there's like this dude with all of his goats and sheep or whatever. <laughs> and he's got like this huge traditional red, like flaming red beard. And he's looking at me like this, like gringo with a tan and short shorts sitting at the end. And he looks at me and I shit you not, he goes. <laughs> and it was like one of those moments where I was like, I was like, oh God. And I like step back and I look at him and I was like, and he was like, so I was like, <laughs> and then he goes, <laughs> and like, I will never know. That was probably 60, 80 foot jump. I will never know like what difference could those 36 inches have made <laughs> that he came over and like the universal language of like, don't jump off that cliff, asshole, communicated to me like what? So that video, smashing success. Like it was something I was so proud of. It was wildly celebrated, it did a zillion views. And, and because of that video, I was able to take this little thing, which is making videos for companies and turn it into a business that was 
uh, a branded content business. The model was really basic. It was like I would make videos like that for companies. I would take that money. I would do my own thing until I ran out of money. And then companies would love when I did my own thing. They said, we want that. And I would just keep it going. And I built it out and I had employees and talented collaborators that I worked with. It was wildly successful and incredibly gratifying. But after, after a little while of that, I got really sick of people saying, you know what you did for Nike? Do that for us. And I started to get exhausted of it. And I realized just how unsustainable that business was, both creatively and then just in every capacity. This isn't something that was scalable. It wasn't something that I knew I could keep doing. And all of a sudden, like, I'm, I'm, I'm back to being like Tarzan and I see the other side of the jungle and I'm just like, what now? I've been standing on this branch for a while and it, it's starting to lose interest. And I remember that's when I got a call from this guy. This is the second person in my entire life who I would call a mentor and a leader and someone I look up to all the time. Someone I'm having lunch with next week. I'll tell him you guys said hi. Um, his name is Sepp Kamvar, and he was a professor at MIT. And he cold called me and he was like, hey, uh, I'd like to invite you to come to the media lab where I'm, I have a lab there, I'm a professor there and I would love for you to work with us. And I don't know a fucking idea what that means. Like I'm a high school dropout, like a 10th grade education, total degenerate. And this guy's calling me and I, I look him up and I understand it and I, I dig more into it. And it's a, it's a uh, the fellowship was a, something that was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, something that was organized by the Sundance Institute, and then something that was really uh, sort of orchestrated and, and, and manifested as uh, spending a solid chunk of time uh, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, working with a number of postgrads there, just doing incredible things. Um, and I remember having the talk with Candace, that's my wife, and um, if you've ever seen any of my videos, you know how easygoing and laid back Candace is. It's a total fucking lie. She is like the most uptight nightmare you'll ever meet. <laughs> and love you, honey. And, and I was like, I want to move to Boston. And she was like, this is a terrible idea. She's like, We're, we just got married. I'm pregnant and you have a company. And I was like, honey, like this vine swung to me. I didn't say this to her because I try not to speak in metaphor to her because it gets her really pissed off. Um, <laughs> This vine swung in my direction, and this was an opportunity that I had to embrace. And internally, it was a big question mark. This was a bigger question mark than anything, because what it meant was literally shutting down my company. And what I had learned from doing, running that company for a couple of years was that the cadence was everything. If I wasn't cranking out video after video on my YouTube channel, my relevance would slowly fade away, and the people that were calling me to offer me jobs would also fade away. And that was a very real reality that every time I experimented with had just proven true. So it was shutting that down. While maintaining all the overhead of that company, it was a gigantic financial risk. Um, and then it was also scary for me. I mean, literally moving to Cambridge and like living in an Airbnb for, for months and months and months and like showing up every day with like a backpack at MIT, like a student ID. I keep the student ID when every time I get pulled over, I like hand it to a cop and he's like, why are you showing me an expired student ID for MIT that just has your picture and name on it? I'm like, <sighs> wrong ID. Um, <laughs> super proud of it. Big deal, guys. But in any event, I had no idea what that might, where that might take me. And we did wonderful things while at MIT. I made videos with them, and I, I helped them build school systems and, and just wonderful, wonderful things. Um, but there was this huge takeaway, and it sounds naive for me to say, especially to an audience like this. But when I was there and I was looking around, what I was realizing was just how powerful technology was and what could be accomplished with it. Um, my business partner, Matt Hackett. Matt, you here? Matt? Fucking guy doesn't show up for my talk. <laughs> Matt, like when Matt and I first started working together at our, our software development company, I'd be like, can we do this? And he's like, Casey, we can, it's software. We can do anything. And that was something that I didn't really understand until I was at MIT. And as I was there, and as I was looking around, and as I was understanding the power of technology, I was also reading this um, wonderful book that I recommend to all of you. Um, it's called Hatching Twitter. And it's about the birth of Twitter. Um, fantastic book. 
But what I took away from that book as I was reading the stories about like a 20 something year old Jack Dorsey with a nose piercing and like dreadlocks who was supposed to launch his app but instead got too drunk at like a uh, EDM concert and passed out and hit his head on the floor and had to go get stitches. And I was like, whoa, these guys are just as smart as me. <laughs> I was like, I can do this. Um, and I left MIT uh, after the semester was over. I moved back to New York City with this idea of starting a technology company. And again, just like grabbing onto a vine that was going to MIT with no idea where it might lead me, starting a technology company as someone who to this day has never written a line of code and have no experience in this space um, felt like a pretty reckless thing to do. And, and Seth, the, the guy I was talking about, my MIT professor, when I was sort of talking him through this idea that I had, I'll never forget like, the language he used. He was like, Casey, is this an art project or is this a business? And I was like, in the moment, I hadn't thought about that yet. And I was like, this is a business. And he was like, OK. And I was like, so what do I do? And he was like, you need, you need money. You need to raise money to do this. And I was like, OK, great. How do I do that? And he's like, write down all the rich people you know. And I was like, OK. There's both of them. And he was like, I was like OK. And then, this, and then at the end of that conversation, he was like, and I'd like to be your first investor. And he wrote me a check for $100,000 right then and there. And this is a guy who's at MIT. He's a professor. He's not a, he's not a, he's a professor. And, and in that moment, I was like, Shit. <laughs> Fuck. I can't give it back or he's going to think I'm a loser. And now I have to do this thing. And that was the moment where I, I that was the scariest vine I ever grabbed onto. And, you know, I moved back to New York City and that's when I met Matt, um, my business partner who's out like gallivanting around Austin right now eating ribs and pulled pork. I hope you're having fun, Matt. Glad you. <laughs> Sure, it was more important than this, bro. Um, Matt and I started this company, and we talked to everybody we, we knew into coming to work for us, and we built this big enterprise out, and we had no idea where this vine might lead us. And then we launched our app, the core product that was our company, and it, it was wildly successful. It was the most successful app launch of the year. And like Apple, who wouldn't even take our phone calls, were calling us, being like, come in, let's meet, let's figure out how we can promote this together. Wild success. And then just like apps do, you know, it started to trickle, it started to fade, and we would kind of like clear and like pump life back into it and get exciting, and then it would sort of fade away. And ultimately, we're just kind of getting our asses absolutely handed to us by Snapchat. Um, and we're like, okay, what now? Like, what now? And that's a scary place for any entrepreneur to be. That's sort of, it's called the trove sorrow. Um, that's like a real Googleable thing. And we weren't sure where that might take us. But one interesting little thing that came out of this experiment in entrepreneurship, this experiment in working in the technology space, is I had this crazy idea to promote the tech company by, by starting a daily, literally this is the birth of the blog, a daily reality show about running a tech company. And then like five minutes into the first episode, I was like, Matt, this is super boring. I'm just going to make it about myself and the tech company will be part of that. And then that manifested as the vlog. So as the tech company was sort of struggling because our product was, was not competing in the competitive space that it existed in, this other thing that was supposed to support that was skyrocketing off, which was the vlog. And when it came time for us to, you know, nine months ago now, to figure out what the next step was for the company, we started meeting with people, we started meeting with investors, we started meeting with companies, we met with a lot of people. Um, and what was really interesting were people were certainly interested in the intellectual property, in the team, in, in what we had demonstrated we were capable of as technologists and entrepreneurs and, and thinkers in this incredibly valuable, highly sought after space, regardless of the fact that our product failed. But people were especially interested in that idea amplified by the fact that I had demonstrated something in this world of new media that was my YouTube channel um, that was elusive and sought after. And what people were excited about were the culmination of, of both of those things. And I, it sounds, again, it sounds naive to say, but it, that's something that I hadn't realized so much until I started to understand that from the people that we were speaking to. To me, the YouTube channel was just this fun thing that I did, and the company was this very serious thing. And I realized the people that I were talking to, they were interested in both. Um, and we met with a lot of really smart people, and we had some really interesting opportunities. The most interesting, by far, was, was meeting with the folks at CNN and understanding what they were doing and what they were trying to do in the digital space. 
And I literally remember calling Seth and like talking to him about CNN. And I was like, if there's one thing I know, it's that I don't want this. And he was like, take a big step back and like, why? And we started to not and pull it apart. And by the end of that conversation, I was like, no, this is exactly what I want. And the reason why I said no at the beginning of that phone call, I realized that like, I had no idea where that vine might swing me to. Like the idea of like, I'm, I'm a, a tech entrepreneur, I guess. And I'm like a YouTuber, I guess. And I'm like a guy who makes like videos where I like steal budgets and then run around Egypt. And now like this idea of working for, for this monster of a company and building something entirely new in the news space felt so radical and foreign, but it wasn't that I wasn't excited. It wasn't that it wasn't interesting. It was that it was fucking scary. And that's what I was reacting to. And it's funny because the more successful you become, the more sensitive to fear and risk you become. And when I started this talk and I talked about how early in my career, I realized the safest thing I could do was to take the biggest chances is because I didn't have much to lose. And the fear that, that predicated finally jumping on board and embracing what this opportunity was, was because I was scared of losing what I had. Um, and, and maybe I failed to see what was in front of me. So that sort of brings me to right now. And, and you know, there's so many questions around what we're doing with CNN. And if you've watched any of the highly informative YouTube videos I've made about what I'm doing with CNN, where I literally say I have no idea what I'm doing with CNN, you'll know that I literally have no idea what I'm doing with CNN. Um, but having no idea what I'm doing isn't uh, an ignorance. It isn't a naivety. It, what it is, is, is it is a strategy. And what I'm trying to do what Matt and I, God bless his heart, Matt. <laughs> what he and I are trying to do is we are trying to literally build a business around that idea of the Tarzan method. And we are trying to compete in a space that's wildly competitive. We're trying to work in a space that people are terrified of, a space that is more divisive um, and, and more sensationalized and, and, and more controversial than ever in a space where we have leadership pushing back against it and, and partisanship and all these scary things and mistrust and all that. We're trying to exist in that space, except instead of trying to approach it the way it's typically approached, we're trying to approach it with sort of a blindness that is like, let's see what we can grab onto first that might work. So let's, let's try making some videos. And that's what we're doing right now. We're making some really great videos. But we have an amazing tech team too. Okay, let's make some technology products and let's see what works. Let's just start shipping shit, which we're gonna do shortly. We're gonna start pushing stuff out. And like, you like it? Great, we're gonna keep going. You don't like it? Like, no big deal. We're just gonna kill it. And that is not how you run a media company. But that has been the model for my entire career that has proven successful thus far. And that's exactly the strategy with CNN right now is that I'm keenly aware and I'm really conscious of, of what all those negatives are when looking at that space because I'm, I'm somebody who embodies them. Um, and what do I want to see? What would I react to? I think it's this and that's what we're doing right now. Um, so that's the gist of it. Uh, before I, I shift to our, our q and A, I I want to play one last video because I said the Make It Count video is my second favorite video, but it was my first favorite video for a really long time. But now I want to show you my new first favorite video that I just made last week. Not because it has any real bearing on this whole presentation, but because I haven't seen it on a big screen with cool speakers yet. <laughs> so I just figured I would seize this opportunity. Um, <laughs> but this is an awesome video. So um, I was on a, I did a, I work very closely with Samsung because um, they're an amazing brand and they're willing to sort of take big chances and, and work with someone like me to do cool things. And we made this uh, commercial that was a television commercial during the Oscars that really celebrated the, the individual creator, the us's of the world. And I love that. And I love the message. But after doing that, I was sort of, it didn't satiate my appetite for celebrating the individual creator. And I wanted to make my own video. Um, that I didn't think Samsung or anybody else would approve, so I just did it on, on, on my own. Um, and that's what this video is. But I think it's, it's three minutes long, but it's also a nice way of ending this talk, and then we're going to jump into a Q&A. Uh, turn it up. This one has, like, a really good song. Like, fucking make this, like, make it bump. Also, the bass is a little high. The bass is just a little, a little bit high. Okay, ready? So excited about this.
To the haters, the doubters, my seventh grade vice principal, to everyone who's ever told anyone with a dream they can't, this video's for you. Keep your head down, follow the rules, do as you're told, play it safe, wait your turn, ask permission, learn to compromise. This is terrible advice. If I were to write an autobiography, a book about my life, one title that would work would be Do What You Can't, because that idea encapsulates everything I've ever done. Like when I wanted to move to New York City and my dad was like, you can't, you don't have any money. Or when I first said I wanted to make movies and it was, you can't, you didn't go to film school. I want to have a TV show, you can't Casey, you're not pretty enough. And to go even further, like if I were to characterize what this new generation of content creators and filmmakers, what, what we all do on YouTube and everywhere else is we do what we can't. You can't be an action movie filmmaker, but you get your parkour friends to dress up like video game characters, jump off some buildings, and you can. Right, Devin? Yes. You can't have a talk show, but you have a webcam and you can. What's up, you beautiful bastards? What? This is my first YouTube video ever. Next thing you know, you're interviewing the president. I heard that you're going to be out of a job soon. Well, maybe I'll start a YouTube show That's or something That's what I'm like thinking. That. You can't fly around New York City on a magic carpet, but you get your electric skateboard, some PVC pipe, a great outfit, give Jesse a call, and you can. What do you think? I'm, uh, this is gonna be so dope. You don't need gear, you don't need trucks or a crane, you don't need some big expensive camera rig that never works. When you're a creator, you don't need someone in your ear telling you what you can and can't do. I'm racing the subway! What you can and can't say. I accidentally did the shocker, oh my god. They call us gamers, influencers, internet famous. What the fuck does that mean? But we know something they don't. You can start a vlog or a makeup channel. Or travel around the world with a gigantic piano playing it in beautiful places for interested people. When you're a creator, all you need is your phone, an internet connection, and a good idea. A story you want to share. Something you need to say. Confidence is within yourself. And then the rest is history. If you do it right, you get to quit the day job. Make friends from places you've never been. Meetups, collaborations. There's just two boys and two video cameras. <laughs> a life moving so fast and so full, you won't even have time to process it. So to my fellow creators, I say, keep creating, keep doing the work. Hey guys! And never forget, you don't have to listen to anyone, because in this new world, no one knows anything. Hi, haters. The haters, the doubters, are all drinking champagne in the top deck of the Titanic, and we are the fucking iceberg. Oh, <laughs> Do what you can't. I was, I was supposed to save 15 minutes for questions, but we have seven minutes. How do the, how do the, oh, questions right here. Um, okay, if you wanted to screen, nope, I'm not gonna ask that question. What would you, <laughs> what would, the question was if you wanted to scream anything at the audience, what would you scream? I've been screaming at you for the last hour. Um, okay, what, uh, what would you consider as your most influential vlog and why? That's tough. I mean, it's a really tough question. I think the most important episodes of the vlog to me are the ones that were uh, about my family. You know, like it, it's hard to appreciate the content when you're turning a new video out every single day. But when I look back at my life then, it's like really interesting to have a literal portrait in video that's well put together of what your life was at that exact moment. But when I think influential, it, probably the video that also got me in the most trouble and the video that was the most controversial and the video that honestly I, I don't even think I, I did a very good job of doing. I think looking back there's a more tactful way to do it but my, um, my endorsement of Hillary Clinton and my 
discouragement towards our now president, Donald Trump. Um, no, and, I, and look, I, I stand by it, and something I've always been very vocal about where I stand politically, and um, it's now sort of a little bit of a handicap because what I want to do with the new company, with CNN, is something that I want to be as apolitical as, as possible personally. Um, but it was something that I, I did believe in, but I, I think that I was so emotional at the time, I think as much of the country was about what was going on, that I didn't approach it as rationally as I could have. So when I think influential, I think that it could have been more impactful had it been less forceful. Um, okay, next question. Uh, <laughs> worst missed opportunity? You know, I, I don't know. I think missing opportunities are something that are very, very hard to, to calculate. I think that, you know, there's like a, a Gary Vaynerchuk. Gary's a great guy, great friend of mine, and Gary has a, a real th a, a thesis about always take every meeting, always meet everyone you can, always give everybody as much time as you can because you never know who it is that you're going to meet or where they're going. I, I can't live that way. And in fact, what I try and do in my life, um, like I literally don't have any cell phone notifications. My phones don't ring when I get a call. They don't make a beep when I get a text. Um, I check my email like once a day at most. Um, I fucking hate distractions. And I've taken that to such a place that I think I probably miss opportunities every single day because of it. Um, but it's the only way I can keep myself somewhat sane. Do I ever sleep? Yeah, sort of. I slept last night a little bit. Um, who are your favorite? No, come on. Keep it rolling here. Keep it rolling. Um, how widespread do you think drone use will become? I think that drones, who cares? But technology in general, and this is so much of part of the ethos of what I've done and, and what I believe in as a creator, and what I said in that video where all you need is your cell phone and an internet connection, is I think that there's something truly beautiful that's happened because of technology, which is it has egalitarianized filmmaking, um, you know, movie making, journalism, everything. Like, what was once something that was only accessible to a few, the few that had access to the technical capabilities to enable sharing their perspectives and ideas, is now available to everyone because of the devices in our pocket. So, when I think about where this is going, uh, I think it's, uh, truly, I think it can it make the world a much better place. I think we're already witnessing that by being able to share what's going on around the world because of what technology is enabling. And I, I think drones are part of that. Um, have you ever let YouTube, no, I'm not from board. Have you ever let YouTube metrics guide your video production? No. Um, how do you choose music to tell your stories? Music's always the hardest part of making videos. Choosing the right song, something that sort of mirrors the emotion that you want, the images and the, the, narr the narrative to tell. Music a, is a real challenge. How do you see your role as a harbinger of... Can you guys see these questions? Can these questions go up on the screen? No? Okay. okay. Yeah, sorry. Uh, do you think you sold your audience when you sold your company? I think it's a good question, Jordan. Jordan, where are you? Um, no, I mean, I think, look, I think that there's a tremendous amount of value in the audience, but, um, you know, the first thing we're doing with the new company is launching a new channel. Um, you know, something that I've been vocal about and the audience loves to fucking ignore no matter how many times I say it is that my YouTube channel wasn't part of the deal. Um, and I mean that absolutely, like it technically wasn't part of the deal, but creatively it wasn't part of the deal. Um, so I think the answer is like a tremendous part of my value is the fact that I have this huge audience. I'm not ignorant to that, but um, I think that sort of the, the negative undertones to a question like that that make you guys go, ooh, um, is, is valid. And I, I get where it's coming from, but I think that you will have to judge me based on what we do. <laughs> What's well, funny? How do you, have you ever grabbed the, how do you make, What's funny? Tell me which ones to ask. What's with the Nike pants? I, I only brought one pair of pants. Like I didn't, you should have seen me at dinner last night with Jake Tapper. He had a fucking suit on. I had my Nike pants. Um, do you ever grab the wrong vine? How can you tell the difference? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think, especially when I get to talk in front of a huge, huge audience like this, it's really fun to talk about 
accolades and successes, but like you always learn more from failures. You always take more from failures. And I have, for every success, I have a dozen failures. Um, they're just not as fun to talk about. Uh, but certainly like, you know, I spent six years of my life chasing down a career in fine art. And when I look back at how misguided that, that was and that energy was, I think that that was the wrong mind to grab onto. But had I not pursued that, I probably, it probably wouldn't have led me to where I am. So I, I always think looking in the rearview mirror is a mistake um, unless you're, you're learning from it. And as long as you continue to find what it is that you're after, it's, it's hard to, to criticize what you've done. What's next for democracy? I don't know. I just said I'm not a journalist. I don't know what's next for democracy. God, what a, that's a heavy question, guys. How did you travel to Austin, like Delta or something? <laughs> is it all about being confident and working hard? I don't know about the confidence bit, but hard work is real. Um, I think hard work's a little too easy to talk about, and I, I try to talk about it less, but my general feelings around hard work are that you will never be the smartest guy, you'll never be the richest guy. Um, in my case, you'll never be the best looking guy. You'll, there'll always be somebody better than you and more talented than you. So the equalizer is hard work. You can always work harder than the guy next to you. And I think enough of that will always get you there. And I don't know a single truly successful person that hasn't gotten there by um, like really a kind, a kind of hard work that is, um, that really dictates who they are and what they do. Um, favorite YouTuber? Nope. That's a, that's a controversial one. What advice would I have for someone who wants to start on YouTube? Sure. Um, I think the trouble with YouTube is also what's beautiful about YouTube, and that is its accessibility. Everyone has the same entry point on YouTube. You just like sign up for the account and like come up with a password and security questions, and you're in. The same way that I'm in with six and a half million subscribers, you're in with zero subscribers. It's a totally fair system. And, and therefore, I think everybody has sort of this sense of entitlement to success. Like, why am I not, I'll stop talking. Why am I not more successful like she is or like he is? And the reality of it is like, I think it's very hard to predict people's appetite. But one key thing that I focus on is that because the, is so, the entry point's so easy, because it's so easy to get started, how to do something that's truly yours, that's, that's unique to you, is very hard. And I think what people typically do on YouTube is they look to what's successful and they say, let me do some of that, and that will make me successful. And by the time you're doing what they're doing, that's already over, because the cycle of creativity on YouTube, the churn is so quick. So my answer to how to be successful on YouTube is make sure you're doing something that no one else is doing. Make sure you're doing something that's true to you. That's not even like a great question to end on, but that young lady just came out with the clipboard that said over time. So guys, thank you. This is a lot of fun.